everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith. Today we're going to be doing a solo setup video for Hexplore It, The Valley of the Dead King. That's this guy right here. So if you haven't heard of this game and this is the first time you are hearing about it, well, you're in luck. I'm going to be doing a full showcase for this thing. Uh, there's also an unboxing on the channel, so if you don't know what's inside the box, you can quickly jump to that video and determine what type of components are inside and see if this is up your alley. Now the really exciting thing about this is this particular playthrough or showcase is going to coincide with the Kickstarter which is currently ongoing. So what's really exciting is that there is a Kickstarter giveaway on this channel currently going right now so if you have already put your name in on that one congratulations you are in for one of two chances to win uh, a copy of Hexport the Kickstarter edition if you are hearing about this for the first time I highly recommend checking out the link in the description below so that you can get your name in on uh, the giveaway as well and have a chance to walk away with a copy of Hexport the Valley of the Dead King Kickstarter edition now I want to I have a little surprise for you guys and this is a real big shocker to me and I'm really excited to be able to offer this out to you guys and I think it's going to make a lot of people really happy and also excited uh, not only for this coming playthrough but also for in order to give the giveaway an even bigger boost. Uh, what we're going to be doing here at Rolling Solo is we're actually going to be increasing the number of winners on the Kickstarter edition giveaway. That's right so it's not going to be two anymore it's going to go to four. So we're going to have four individuals drawn when this particular giveaway ends. Four lucky winners will be walking away with Hexport, the Valley of the Dead King. So that's the first iteration or chapter of this game. And that'll be fantastic. Of course, they all have to be different people, of course. But four people will be randomly drawn. You're, so your odds have gone up. If you have already got your name in, you're already set. You don't have to do anything else. If you haven't, get your name in. Do not miss out on this. You've got a big chance to walk away with a copy of this for free. Now what's really cool, something else to note before we get into the solo setup here, is that this game is on Kickstarter, but it's not this one you're seeing in front of you. It's actually, there's actually an ad or uh, basically there was an ad inside of the game box when I opened this up during the unboxing, which actually spoke to the expansion that is currently on Kickstarter. So if you want to find out more about that particular expansion, you can check out the description below. There'll be a link directly to the Kickstarter, which is currently ongoing and has found a ton of success out of the gates and is likely to continue to unlock stretch goals and become even more successful. Now what's really cool about this is that this playthrough on Rolling Solo will be kind of going along along with the Kickstarter so it's not connected in any way but it's just good timing so in other words we'll be able to actually play through this while you can actually decide whether or not this is something you want to back uh, at the same time of that uh, you also have the ability to potentially win the game for free or at least the original one which is the one you're seeing in front of you so that's never a bad thing, right? So thank you guys so much for your support so far. We've already burned three minutes into this video, but I hope that was a well worth it three minutes. And we are right now going to get up into the solo setup. So the first step in the solo setup process is going to be going through this wonderful stack of different roles that your character can potentially be. Now, in my case, I'm picking two of these roles as I'm going to play with two characters, which is totally fine for solo play. Uh, what I can do or could have done as well is also played with more than two, or I could have also played just with one character, like true solo, with just a single character to, to handle the entire time. But I thought it would be fun for the purposes of the playthrough to have two characters to bounce synergies off each other and potentially help each other out along the way. So we're going to go through this stack and near the end I'm going to show you or reveal the two characters or roles I should say that we're actually going to be fulfilling with our two characters. So the very first one here is a Rebel Rouser. Now each of these characters, I'm not going to talk about the player board, we're going to go over this in depth in the rules overview so you get a better understanding of what's going on here. Uh, we will talk about filling this out a little bit in this solo setup as well, uh, but we'll talk more about the rules side of it in that rules overview. So we'll flip this over to show you the artwork for the Rebel Rouser. Again, the artwork in the game is mind-bogglingly nice in terms of what's on the back of these particular uh, player cards or... or um, roll cards. Um, so the Berserker here is another choice and there's the Berserker's artwork. Again, fantastic stuff. Uh, the Wilder. There's the Wilder. Uh, the Elementalist. The element Elementalist. The Necromancer. Very cool. Again, like the, the artwork in this, I've, I'm a huge fan of. I, I'm, I'm going to try to go through these at a relatively quick pace. You can always pause if you want 
because you can see the title yourself as well as the artwork. But I really just want to give you a feel as to the different types of roles that you could potentially be in this world. And also if you see a character that potentially interests you that you'd want to try and become on your journey through Hexploric. Um, the artist uh, for the game did a fantastic job of really making that vision pop. So I thought it'd be worthwhile to go through these to show you the different types of characters that you can be. Uh, or roles you can fulfill. So, Weaponsmith, pretty cool mechanical kind of bot. Uh, I got like a hunter here. Uh, the trap specialist. That's some fantastic artwork as well. You see, and if anyone's seen my unboxing, you've also seen a majority of these as well during that. But like I mentioned, I was able to uh, get a deluxe copy. And because of that, I may have some extras here that I didn't have in the base. Uh, but I could be totally mistaken. They may all be the same across both. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. So you'll have to uh, look into that on your own. Uh, so we're down here the sh uh, the Shaman. We're down to the priest and we're getting real close to the ones that I chose to select and based on your feedback for this playthrough. Uh, so there's a nomad and there, here we go. This is where we start. So this is the second last uh, character sheet. And so the summoner is going to be our first character for the playthrough. I thought having a character that is a striker class, but also, um, be able to summon and use magic and that type of thing would be really cool and add a different element than a typical, uh, you know, tank. Uh, so I think this is going to be really interesting and kind of throw a little bit of a dynamic in the playthrough that I think will be really fun. We'll see how it turns out. This is the summoner's uh, artwork. So obviously looking extremely cool. She has two elementals. Looks kind of like an earth elemental or troll that she's uh, either controlling through mind manipulation or has summoned herself. Uh, but very, very cool artwork uh, for this particular character. So I'm happy to be using that one. And as you guys likely saw when I flipped this over, I've revealed the second character and that is gonna be the guardian because what we want is we want somebody, or at least what I wanted uh, was somebody that could kind of assist or or, uh, help out the summoner uh, through the journey and I think the Guardian's uh, artwork is also absolutely amazing. She is fantastic. So we're gonna have two uh, individuals here that are gonna be teaming up going into the world and we have now essentially chosen our roles. All right, we have our two character roles selected. So the next thing to select is the races. Now there's a race per character, of course, and we're able to select these by looking at them, of course, or we could potentially do a random. Now what I did was I shuffled the deck here off camera. We're gonna be pulling these races to determine what is going to be what for each of these characters. We won't know until I flip this deck over. So again, we've got our guardian on the left and we've got our summoner on the right. So let's go ahead and find out what races we're gonna be for this play through. So the top card here is Angelborn. So this is the race that we'll be using and actually now that I look at it that's a fantastic card to get. Um, that works absolutely perfect with this particular character so I think that was a flawless thing to pull. I don't think that's going to happen uh, very often with the number of different races in the game but we're going to talk more about this particular card and what it does and how we're going to fill out this particular role sheet in a second. So we now know Angelborn is going to be connected as race to our uh, guardian. Now we're going to come over here to our summoner and find out the race of our summoner. She is going to be a shifter. Okay, well that's actually pretty thematic. That works out great. So uh, again, I can't tell you too much about the rules side of things with this. We'll talk more about that in the rules overview. But now we've got our uh, roles as well as our races figured out. So now that we've determined the role as well as the race for our characters, let's go ahead and fill in our hero sheet. And I'll show you guys how to do this. It's pretty straightforward. We're gonna go over here to the ability section and as you can see we've got attack, defend and use item, first mastery, second mastery. There's a hex here with a bunch of numbers around it. We won't talk about that until we get to the rules overview. But what really matters right here is this small hex, the brown hex to the side with a two. That is gonna give you your base ability stat as per your particular role. So as a guardian, I'm gonna have two in the attack to start with. I'm also going to have three to defend. I'm going to have one here in terms of a first mastery and as a secondary mastery, I'm going to have a one. Now, if we keep moving on down, we find the skills section, which is going to have things like navigate, explore, and survival, and they're tied to different dice. So again, we'll talk more about that in the rules overview, but simply just populate the numbers as you have them across the board here. I do apologize if my ones look like twos, I'm doing my best to kind of avoid that. Um, and then over here for vitals, we've got seven and five. So seven and five, that is for your health and your energy. We'll talk more about what happens over here later, but essentially once we have determined our 
total ability. We're going to keep track of where we are currently with our health and our energy over here. Also, what's really important too is food rating. That's going to come into it as well right now because we need to actually populate the rest of our stats based on the race card that we pulled. It's going to adjust some of our stats. And this is where the dynamicness of your character really comes to life. And what I really like about the game is that if I played a Guardian and I had a different race uh, than the Angelborn, my stats would completely change just from the get-go alone. So it's really cool to see how your race really comes into affecting your actual skills, your abilities, your vitals, all that kind of stuff. It's really interesting. I really like it. So this case, uh, what we see here is Angelborn, and we got a Spirit as our favored, uh, our favored opponent. So we're going to want to make sure we write that in into this favored opponent box here. So I'm going to go ahead... And I'm going to write spirit so we know that that's the type of uh, either creature or foe or, or entity that we are uh, favored against. And essentially that means we kind of uh, favor it in when we're actually attacking it. We'll talk much more about that in the rules overview. I'll skip it through now. The next thing that's really important is the food rating. We want to make sure we write that down. So our food rating right here can be a 1. And this is again based off the race card as well. The next thing that's really important and really cool is what I was talking about in terms of stat changes. You'll see here that there's different stats that are highlighted in white and they're basically telling you to adjust or modify your base um, roll stats that are right here that we just did by these particular increments. So in this case, vitals are going to go plus one health, plus three energy. So that means we're going to be starting with eight in terms of health and technically eight in terms of energy as well. So that's really going to beef up our character. Again, if I hadn't have pulled Angelborn, I may not have gotten an eight and eight. It might have been totally different. Uh, over here, we've got abilities. The only ones that we gain anything on are the first mastery and second mastery, one and two respectively being bumped up. So over here, we're going to come to our two ones, which are actually quite bad uh, in terms of abilities, because anything that's one is never going to be a good thing, especially when you're trying to make checks. Uh, so we're going to be jumping up one extra one here to a two, which is not bad. And then this one down here is going to become a three. So all of a sudden our stats are looking a little bit more balanced, which is great. And then we're going to go over here to skills. You'll notice the only skill boost we get is navigation. Uh, sadly, it's not any of the other ones. Uh, but I guess we got two here in survival, so that's not too bad. But the bump up is in navigate, so now we're going to be at a three here for this particular character, the Guardian. Now, the other thing you're noticing that I'm completely ignoring, and that is the name. Now, I want you guys to actually, in the comments below, give me a name for our Angel Born Guardian. I want to know what you think we should be calling this character. Again, if you want to, I'll do a quick flip of the board so you can again see the artwork. This may give you a good idea as to uh, a good name or may help you make up a good name. So let me know in the comments below what you think we should name our Guardian. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly do this exact same step without any explanations going through with the summoner. So here we are with the summoner. Again, we're going to go ahead with the favored opponent. We're going to take a quick look and we'll see that it's a creature. So let's go ahead and just populate that ahead of time, just so that's in there. So we know that the favored opponent for the summer is a creature. We're going to go ahead and bump up our abilities. And what I'll do this time is I'm going to actually reference this as we go along so we don't have to erase anything. So when we're going through our abilities here, we can actually start with the top for vitals. We get plus two health on whatever we have, plus an energy. So technically this is going to go from five to seven for our health. And six is going to end up turning into seven because of the plus one. So a seven and seven character, a little bit less than our guardian, but that kind of makes sense thematically. So uh, we're going to come over here to abilities. You'll notice there's different abilities that have been bumped up. So we're going to get an extra one here in attack because of being a shifter. So this is going to go from one to two. Uh, over here in our defense and use item stat, it's going to go up by one. So we're going to go from a two to a three. The first mastery gets no advantage whatsoever. Second mastery gets plus two. So the first mastery, no change. Whereas uh, the second or the first mastery, no change. Uh, the second mastery, though, is going to go up by two. So that's going to make three. So this is some absolutely mind crunching math I'm doing here, right? So we're going to come over here to the skills section. Uh, we've got three different skills, navigate, explore, and survival. And the only one actually on this particular character, different from our Angelborn one, is the explore is up by one. So we'll have a one here in navigate. We're going to have a three in explore. And we're going to end up having a two in survival. 
So that's going to uh, finish that off, except for the food rating, which is also very important. We'll talk more about that later on. So two goes in for the food rating. And again, like my other character here, I want to know your guys' opinion on what we should be calling the summoner. I want to have a good name. So let me know in the comments below, what would you like to name our summoner? So this is a, a decent view, hopefully, with as little shimmer as possible of the Art of the summoner so go ahead and come up with a name now again just so you guys are aware both of these characters are female so that is going to also enter into uh, your submissions in terms of names uh, so let me know in the in the comments below I'm really excited to hear uh, what you what you think um, so that's essentially going to wrap up uh, filling in the hero sheets for our two characters all right next we're going to go ahead and fill in the gold value that each of our characters gets to start with and when playing with a one or two player game in this case we're playing two player but we're technically playing solo each of our characters are going to gain 24 gold each so you're gonna go right here to this gold area on the play mat and you're gonna go ahead and put in 24 and of course we'll be spending this uh, probably right away to be boosting up uh, a number of different things but you're gonna go ahead and want to denote that so that you don't forget how much gold you actually have um, again it says here that if your food rating is one or more your hill will need to eat so we'll be talking more about uh, how food works in the game but neither of our heroes are immune to eating. Uh, you also notice here that I accidentally did not put in uh, the food rating uh, for our summoner. So let me go ahead and do that now, which is a two. So both of our characters require food as they journey through the land. Next, we're gonna go ahead and set up the actual game board. So we've got a quest bar here, which needs to be assembled. So essentially you're gonna slide it together like so, and just place it in equal distance or spaced out in between the quest bar, which will sit down in this area. You can see quests and there's uh, areas here for different cards that will be drawn very, very shortly. Up here at the very top, we got the circumstance bar way up here. And of course, uh, this one's upside down because the hexes interconnect. As you can see, there's hex pattern there and a hex pattern over here and that's where the map will be laid out uh, so normally when you're playing against somebody else there will be cards coming from the circumstance deck which is over here pointing this way for this playthrough though I'm gonna actually have the cards turn we'll keep this just like this but we're gonna flip the cards around so you guys are able to read them and of course I'll do close-ups as needed uh, but basically you're gonna space these two things out so that you have full availability to put your map quadrants in the middle so let's go ahead and fill in the space with that map right now all right just like that we've got our four map quadrants all laid out so we've gone ahead and actually squeezed the map together which is really cool allows the circumstance bar as well as the quest bar to rest on either side and then the map is built in between now you might be wondering why did I build it in this orientation there's actually a number of different ways you can build this out and this adds to the replayability of the game now when you're first setting up your very first game this is the recommended pattern from the manual that you should set up your game for however there is a document inside of the game called the Acalon's Guide to the Valley. Now what this is all about, for those of you that are wondering, is essentially a book, although it's only a few pages long, that's just littered with a whole bunch of different ways to orientate these types of tiles. And you'll notice though that it makes use of a number of different tiles that are in the game that you're not seeing right now. This right now might be hard to distinguish how many I've actually put out here, but there's actually only four quadrants. So right now, if you can actually see the dividing lines, you can see there's a cut, there's a cut. So I've got four separate major pieces here. Coming back to this book, that's how they want you to do it at the beginning. But coming back to this uh, Aklon's Guide to the Valley, we have multiple different ways to set up using those four, but then also using small individual pieces to create really interesting patterns. And it's not just this, it's all of this. There is a ton. And of course, you don't need this to be creative yourself and, and customize your layout before you start the game, but it sure as heck creates some pretty interesting and unique patterns on the board as well as it also adds a really interesting thematic tie-in here with uh, the Acalon's as, uh, Astro Labe, if I'm even pronouncing that correctly. So there's basically a quest that you can actually go fulfill by finding this particular hex, bringing something to this individual. There's a full letter here from this individual, um, as well as this is essentially his written letter or book to you. So it's really cool, it's a nice handy little thing to have. And, uh, and of course, we'll add to the thematic feel of the game. You could probably don't need it on your first playthrough as you'll be sticking with this as your base way of playing the game for the first time. So for this particular playthrough, we're gonna set with the um, original uh, rule book inspired map layout and jump from here. 
Next up, we're gonna find the circumstance as well as the quest deck, which is circumstance has the exclamation mark and the question mark is the quest deck. You can even see that right here, quests are question mark, and way up here, circumstances are exclamation marks. So you're gonna find two deck boxes. Again, these are gonna be non sleeve cards, of course, in these deck boxes. So for those of you that want to sleeve like me at times uh, for particular games, this is gonna be a little bit of a pain because you're not able to put them back in, but uh, it's really nice to be able to protect them in a box when you store it away. Regardless, we're gonna open these up and we're gonna fulfill by actually putting the decks in the particular spots they're supposed to be, as well as beginning to reveal some of the cards for the quests and circumstances to begin the game. All right, just like that, we've got the quest deck and the circumstance deck all set up. So let's go ahead and pull these. Now we're gonna do the quest last. We'll do the circumstance one first. As you can see here, there's positions for each of the cards we pull. One, two, three, four, five. So we're supposed to be in the game, pull those five cards. I'm going to show you them uh, up close on camera, but not talk about them until the rules overview and or the beginning or first part of our playthrough. So we're gonna go ahead here, grab the first card off the top, and we've got bandits. What a fantastic way to start here. So we got humanoid bandits. Uh, they're gonna be sitting in position number one. We've got, what else in the circumstance deck? We've got ourselves some event, a helpful commoner. Okay, so somebody we can, looks like we can escort this individual, something else we can look into. Next up, we've got Shady Informant. That sounds kind of cool, it's another event. So we'll have to figure out what is involved with that. These are looking pretty good so far. Uh, uh, ooh, the Four Giantesses of the Palaquin Man. That sounds like it could be good if it's treasure, I would guess. Um, lastly, We've got, ooh, another treasure, Enchanted Hourglass. I don't know if that's a good pull or a bad pull, but regardless, that is our five circumstance cards to start off our playthrough. Next up, we're gonna go to the quest deck, so let's start pulling these things off one at a time. Of course, they're right in front of us, a little easier to manage. Uh, this one is Aid, so we've got an Aid quest, which we'll put like that. We're gonna go ahead and pull the next one. It's a Blue Survival. So we need some successes on survival for this particular. Uh, and you'll notice here that the hexes actually are pictured where these things are located. We'll talk more about that in a second. The King's Lair. Okay, so another quest for the King's Lair. A bounty. Bounties are good. So we'll go ahead and put the bounty down. Got nice color variation here, if anything else. Uh, dual. Ooh, that's kind of cool. So... Interesting. Okay, so we got some options here for sure. So now that we've actually placed out the five quests as well as the five circumstances to start the game, next up we're going to populate some of where these quests actually are located on the quadrants within the map. All right, just before we go ahead and actually populate the map with where these quests are actually located, that's one of the coolest things about revealing these quests at the beginning of the game is they're all going to tie into certain quadrants that we've revealed and some we haven't. So there's going to be a deck of, uh, or not a deck, but a pile of other quadrants that have not been revealed that are higher than D. So these are A, B, C, and D, and you can tell that by the letter right there in the bottom or top, depending on which one you're talking about in terms of tile. These are the four different tiles, and of course, each of these quests also have an A or a C or an M. So A and C we have, for instance, M's we do not because M's would likely come from this deck later on. This deck will likely be involved as soon as we explore off the edge of the map on any of the four sides of the board or four corners of the board, I guess, or any edge in general. And then over here, we've got a K, which we haven't seen as well. So really when we're populating quests, there will only be two that are in play from the start of the game. So we're also gonna populate the board area here, like a quest tile. So this area here has a icon here representing a question mark. That's where these five quest tokens we're about to talk about are gonna be placed. And then they're placed onto the map based on whether you have quests in this stack that actually relate to a quadrant. So in this case, aid here is an A tile. You're gonna to have to actually look at the card and distinguish which tile or hex, I should say not tile, but hex this is actually on. So you can see here, we've got a bunch of what looks to be the kind of wooden crates or something along those lines. And we're gonna to have to try to find that in quadrant A. So if we come all the way over here and we take a look this right here appears to be the tile in question. So that's where one of these quest markers are going to go. And this is gonna denote that when we get to this area and we decide to take on a quest, it's going to be this aid quest. Then we move over to this particular one for survival and it's noting that it's on a, the C tile, which is right here. Now, this particular one has an interesting little cave or cavern kind of on the tile itself, uh, but as you can see, 
Um, it's a little bit off-centered and kind of, well, I guess it's southwest of the center of that tile cell or of that hex. You can see here we've got three to choose from. The one that's most southwest is this one. This one here is more southeast. So I'm thinking this is the right one. So we're going to take the quest marker and put it down just like that. All right, so now we've actually satisfied all of uh, putting the markers down for all the quests that we currently can. We obviously can't for the other ones because M and K are not currently revealed. What we can do is finish putting out all the other tokens that belong on this board for uh, organizational purposes, I guess. So we've got this Dead King token here, which we're going to place right here. Now, of course, if we're using the miniature, that's likely going to be replacing that token, and I have that. Uh, the other thing is on the opposite side of the board, I've also gone ahead and I flipped all of these circumstance cards facing us, because if you're playing solo, why would you face it the opposite way? That's normal two-player or more. Solo-wise, face it towards yourself to make life easy. Take each of the tokens that you can find in the box, there'll be a number of them, that look like these, and place them in their appropriate spot. Pretty straightforward. So you'll find this particular token like this, place it like this, and of course I'm facing them all towards me. We're going to talk more about what these are and what they involve during the rules overview. For now, just place them on the board in the indicated spots to set up. So we've got those four in place. Lastly, we're going to have a big stack of what looks to be monster related tokens and then a bunch of hex ones as well. All right, and just like that, we've gone ahead and we finished off the quest setup as well as the uh, quest board and circumstance board token setup. All right, next up, we're going to get the dice out. So each character is going to have a set of dice, and they're going to be the three different colored dice that come in the bag. So we get one of each. So as you can see on the player board here, we've got a blue die. You can set them wherever you want. I'm just going to place them exactly where they're on the player board, but you don't have to do that. Uh, so we're going to put one for each of the characters because rules will be made, whether it comes from navigate, explore, or survival. And these different dice are going to be the dice you're going to be rolling depending on your check or what it is you're trying to succeed at, hopefully. And in most cases, we're going to try to succeed. So let's move on to the next step. This right here is considered the Wander Compass. And so you're just going to want to have a die handy. So in this case, I'll place one of the hex dies in that area for when wandering comes into play, which we'll talk about how that works in the rules overview. But for now, just have a die in place so that you're able to roll it when needed. Next step is to grab that power-up deck. So get this deck out of the box, go ahead, shuffle it, get it ready. You'll see it's right on the deck itself, so you can't miss it. Once it's all shuffled and ready, just take that deck and place it anywhere off to the side that you have space. So in this case, I'll put it right here. I don't want it to be up in these areas because as we explore off into the board, this may grow larger. So I'm just placing it very close to the quest deck off to the side. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to roll a die to determine our starting city. Now, we also have miniatures in the game. So this one right here is the Dead King of the Valley. So we'll go ahead. I'm going to put this miniature for now where the Dead King token is. Just so we know he's always creeping on the outer edge, waiting to find his way into the realm and cause mass chaos. So his, essentially, you could think of it kind of thematically like a little bit like Lord of the Rings or something like that, where there's a presence growing or a dark presence growing. There's uh, rumors going around through the towns that, you know, something or someone is coming. And, uh, and he is just, he hasn't actually landed in the realm just yet, but he is going to emerge out of the shadows at some point and start causing chaos. Now, as the heroes, we have a miniature here to represent our hero party in total. But in order to put this on the board, like I said, we need to roll this hex die to figure out where we're going to start. You'll notice on the hex board itself, we've got all kinds of numbers near each of the cities. We're going to talk a lot more about the icons on the map and things like that. There's probably tons of questions you guys have in terms of what you're seeing. Don't worry, the rules overview is coming up next. I'm going to be covering all of the detail of what you're looking at, how to actually process it and understand it, because there's a number of different icons here that may be confusing. But let's just focus on getting our heroes into a starting city. So for now, I'll take the die that's technically for the wandering um, situation. I'm going to use this actually to roll to determine which city of the six we're going to actually start in. So of course you've got one, two, three, four, five, and if I roll a hex, it's dead center. There is uh, six sides on each of these die, but the sixth side is a hex um, is a hex side of the die. So let's roll this and find out where we start because this is really impact how the game begins. 
Oh, look at that. We got the hex. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but hey, that's a great position. We are dead center in the middle of the map. So maybe that actually isn't a bad thing. Um, and looking at where our quests are, it couldn't have been really that much better unless we got one, maybe. Uh, so it's not a bad place to start. We're not going to have to do too much traveling to get to maybe some of the first things we can go after uh, when we do begin the playthrough. Another thing to keep close by is the reference sheets for all the bosses. That's very important. You'll see they're all denoted uh, 1 through 10, although you'll see all the odd numbers on one side. And if you flip it over, you'll get the even on the other side. So there's 10 full bosses here inside the game. And of course, the 10th one is the Valley of the Dead King or the Dead King himself right there. So he's going to be the guy we're going after. Of course, we can actually run into or uh, potentially have to deal with other bosses throughout the game. You're just going to want to keep these uh, handy. So just pile them all up and put them off to the side until they come into play. Other things you're going to want for the setup to keep close by is a reference of the game turns. Again, we'll be talking about this in the rules overview. So this is going to give you a nice breakdown of how the game turns work out from start to finish. So keep that in a handy spot. Next up, we've got things for cities. Again, you're noticing the icon that we talked about earlier. Depending on which city we start in, different things happen. So in this particular case, we started on the Hex, which is actually Rest Wind Dale. So you can actually go ahead right now and read that. We'll be talking more about it when we start our playthrough uh, but that may be one of the better ones I don't know we'll find out sure soon enough at least on the back side of this is the market which is another icon there that we had seen on the board as well these are things that uh, you can find inside of cities essentially that you can go ahead and purchase for your characters using the gold that we had gone ahead and done this is actually a great time if you guys notice we have 24 gold per character if you want to go ahead and pause the screen let me know in the comments below what items you think I should pick up before I venture forth I would gladly take any suggestions for a strategy. That would be fantastic. Um, next up, we have another one. You're only going to need one of these when you're playing solo. So you can take the second one that's included in the box and toss it for now. Don't throw it away, of course. Uh, the other one here is shrines. So again, it just lines up. You'll find these shrines at certain points in the game, likely on uh, further exploration of other tiles that are no longer or that are not in the game at the beginning, like these, this deck over here. And these shrines are going to allow you to do different things. Again, we'll talk more about that in the rules as well as when we actually run into them. There's blessings. There's also ruins. So there's those types of things you can run to on the board as well. Again, things to talk about when we actually get there, but just keeping that handy is what you need. Again, what I'm going to be doing for the playthrough purposes, I'll be keeping the battle mat dead center in the middle here on either side of my summoner as well as the guardian over here. And the battle mat we'll talk more about during the rules overview as to how this actually works. I'll maybe give a couple examples of how a, a combat would work out. Um, what I really anticipate going uh, forward is that this essentially wraps up what you need to get the game to the table. There is nothing else you need to do for solo play. Uh, the actual rulebook itself has a section in the back called play styles. And this play style section allows you to basically supplement or add to your game experience. You can do certain things like double up. You can play a mirror. Marathon, marathon style, multiple heroes, one player, things like that. What you'll notice here is it's saying here um, there are two ways to play using this style. The first is to use two heroes. This is the easier option and requires no special rule, rule changes. The reason I'm going with that for one player is because I don't have to deal with any additional rules changing things. I can play as the game was meant to be played without any supplemental rules to it. Um, there's also even um, the ability to play uh, one versus all. So this is going to uh, be a whole other variant where essentially, of course, you're, someone's going to be playing as the Dead King. And then, of course, you've got the Dead King deck. Now, there's an actual deck inside the box that you'll find that looks like this. And this deck it will be used for that particular uh, play style. So I'm not using that, so I won't have to worry about that uh, during this particular playthrough. So that pretty much wraps it up. That's all you need to know to get the game to the table without any rules explanation. Next Next up, we're going to be getting deep into it to talk to you guys a little bit about how this system works. We're going to be covering the entire rules overview at a high level, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty in the playthrough. Hopefully you guys are as excited as I am. Leave your comments down below in terms of 
not only, most importantly, the names of our characters for the Summoner and for uh, the Guardian, both of which need names still. So let me know and uh, I'll see you in the rules overview. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to check out the giveaway and do not miss out. Four copies of Hexplorit, the Valley of the Dead King, are going to be given away here on Rolling Solo. And I don't want anyone that is a subscriber of Rolling Solo to miss out. So thank you for your support. I'll see you in the rules overview. As always, keep on rolling solo.